Thank you. So I'm going to uh, introduce our first speaker. As you know, our, our, our two speakers today are Will Gonzalez and Felicia Bismarck. And uh, I also wanted to warn everybody that there will not be a reception today at the end uh, of uh, uh, the colloquium. However, we will be meeting in person on Monday uh, right by the LSNA building or LSA building um, under the, the canopy there between 11.30 and 1.30. So I just wanted to let you know about that. So I'm going to start uh, by introducing uh, Will Gonzalez. For me, it's a real pleasure today to introduce Will. Will is a fourth year graduate student specialized in language contact and language documentation, which he examines using ethnographic, corpus based experimental and computational methods. His co advisors are myself, Sally Thomason, and Andris Cotier. Will has published widely on a variety of topics, including colloquial Singapore English. Lanangwe language and identity, and split infinitives in world Englishes, among many other topics. And he has published his work in journals such as English Language and Linguistics, Language and Communication, Asian Englishes, and the Journal of Pidgin and Creole Languages. Will has done a lot for the Lanangwe community of speakers as well, and is the director of the Lanangwe Language Archives that goes a long way in promoting the documentation of the language. Will is also a great teacher and received the Deborah Keller Cohen Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching last year. He defended his dissertation last month. The title of his dissertation is Truly a Language of Our Own, a Corpus-Based Experimental and Variationist Account of Lanangwe in Manila. I'm also delighted to announce that Will will start a new position in August 2022 as an assistant professor in applied English linguistics at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. The title of his presentation today is Sociolinguistic Variation in a Mixed Language, a Corpus-Based Analysis of Lanangwe Conjunctions and Prepositions. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Will Gonzalez. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for the introduction, Marlies. Um, so yeah, before anything else, um, I'd really like to take this opportunity to thank the department and all the people involved in the colloquium for the invitation to uh, share my research. It's really unfortunate that we're not meeting in person. I really expected to, you know, like us to meet in person, but in the interest of safety, I think it's uh, it's really uh, important that we take precautions. But I'm really uh, thrilled to share my part of my dissertation virtually. So as Marli said, the title of my talk today is uh, Sociolinguistic Variation in a Mixed Language, a Corpus-Based Analysis of Lanangwe Conjunctions and Prepositions. So essentially my talk features a chapter in my dissertation. Um, it'll just give you a, a snapshot of it. Um, it is a study that is a part, as part of a larger research program investigating sociolinguistics in the context of multilingualism in the Philippines and in greater East Asia. I will talk about how social factors interact with one language spoken in the Philippines, particularly uh, the one spoken in Manila, so Lanangwe. So I will, make, uh, I will first set the stage by giving some relevant background. Then I will uh, talk about my research questions and hypotheses. Then I will spend some time discussing the methodology and present the key findings. Then some directions for future research and some key takeaways uh, will form the conclusion of the presentation. All right, so um, let's get the ball rolling, I guess. So starting with a question you probably have been asking since the beginning of the talk. So what is Lanangwe, right? The word Lanangwe comes from the Hokkien phrase Lan Langwe, which uh, means our people's speech. It is a predominantly oral linguistic variety used in the Philippines with Hokkien, Tagalog, and English derived elements. And it has characteristics of mixed languages and is used by the Lanangs or here defined as individuals with mixed Chinese and Filipino heritage. So I want you to experience listening to the language. So here's an audio clip, hopefully there won't be any issues. Here's an audio clip of a kid using Lana Wei with his mom in the context of food preparation. Let me see. Hey, go me add time pa, chaka, chaka salt, chaka white pepper. 
All right. So as you can see, the language is mixed. You see elements derived from Hokkien in red, elements derived from Tagalog in blue, and those derived from English in green. So one interesting thing about Nanagwe is that its users have varied perceptions towards uh, the linguistic variety. So on the one hand, you have individuals, some individuals recognizing it as a language that sets them apart from those without Latin heritage. But then you also have, on the other hand, people who do not consider it a language and view it as a lesser form of Hokkien that is unsystematic and quote-unquote idiolectal. And in my dissertation, um, I found that beliefs do not equate practices most of the time. Um, despite having diverging beliefs about Lan Ang Wei, almost all speakers follow a similar set of linguistic and sociolinguistic conventions. And I found evidence of systematicity, innovation, and stability in this admixture. One major finding was the existence of conventionalized lexicalized, uh, lexical patterns in conjunctions and prepositions, as well as, a, as well as the existence of some variability. So, so in Lan Ang Wei, certain word classes are systematically derived from particular source languages. So for example, there are conjunction classes that are derived from Hokkien, and then there are other conjunction classes that are derived from Tagalog or English. So this schematic diagram helps to illustrate the unquote, distribution. I refer to these patterns as distributional patterns. So let me give actual examples so that it, it, um, so you understand what I'm trying to say here. So for example, in Lanang Wei, conjunctions that have a, an adversative function are generally sourced from Tagalog, um, whereas conjunctions that have cumulative non-emphatic function are generally sourced from Hokkien. So we have pero, for instance, in the first row, uh, sorry, the second row of the first table, uh, we have pero from Tagalog and kap from Hokkien in the third row. And we notice this pattern in th these patterns in prepositions as well. So these distributional patterns are what I hope to schematize in this diagram. Another major finding was that the distributional patterns were not always followed. So in other words, there, I, I noticed variation. So for instance, I found that conjunctions and prepositions that are typically sourced from Tagalog, for example, sometimes get sourced from English or Hokkien. For example, the English derived conjunction but um, means but is used instead of the, uh, the conventionalized Tagalog derived um, conjunction pero, for instance. So my question is, is this, uh, is, um, is this um, variation free or is it structured? The literature in contemporary sociolinguistics would argue that free or random variation is a myth and claim that variation is ordered and structured in every language. So essentially my thought process is, uh, if Lano is language-like, then its variation must also be structured or conditioned by something. So in this talk, I want to answer the following question. Will sociolinguistic factors account for the variation in conjunction and preposition use? Specifically, will age, sex, language proficiency in the source languages, and language attitudes condition the variation observed in Lano Oe? I specifically wanted to focus on these factors as these have been robustly found to condition language use in my previous work. And answering these questions is really important because the findings contribute to the understanding of diversity, not just in the Philippines, but also in the East Asian region. And I also really wanted to contribute to the relatively scarce variationist feature research in that region. So, um, wait, okay, so, I hypothesize that at least one of the following sociolinguistic factors will condition the variation in conjunction and preposition use. So these factors include self-reported source language proficiency, attitudes, age, and sex. In other words, a variation will be sociolinguistically structured. And I didn't come up with all these, um, this hypothesis out of the blue because they, these were all motivated by previous work, which found the effects of the mentioned sociolinguistic factors on likelihood to use a particular variant or linguistic feature. So for example, in my earlier research on uh, vowel monophthongs or just monophthongs, I found that age and sex conditioned the little amount of variation in vowel production. Young females were more likely to have a vowel system that is somewhat distinct from the popular variant, right? And I observed that this pattern of sociolinguistic conditioning also in other levels of Lanang Wei. So what about the direction of condition effects? So earlier I hypothesized that there will be effects, but what about the direction of the effects? 
So with regard to proficiency, I expected speakers with high proficiency in particular languages to be more likely to use variants sourced from those languages, regardless of whether the use of that variant is conventional. This, this is a very likely scenario coming from a language transfer perspective, uh, where knowledge of a language and its vocabulary could make it more likely for the individual to draw on those resources in the production of another language. And this hypothesis is also possible as research has shown that individuals can use language to express social meaning. So for instance, um, one can use more English elements to show that they are good in English, right? So that's one of them. Okay, so moving on with regards to attitudes, I hypothesize that speakers who view Manawe as broken, as a broken variety or language, and those who view it as not reflective of their mixed identity will be more likely not to follow these patterns or follow the patterns, right? So uh, this hypothesis is also justified as uh, research has shown that negative attitudes towards uh, a language or language features can condition the avoidance of certain features or variants traced in that language. And finally, if the variation here is in the, it's indicative of in innovation, then I hypothesize that young and female speakers will be more likely to use a non-conforming or uh, less popular variants um, this is a well-documented pattern in social linguistics, especially in the context of sound change or language change. And furthermore, I have observed this pattern in Lanawe vowels. So I expect this pattern to also emerge here as well. So again, just to remind everyone, I'm interested in looking to test whether certain social linguistic factors account for a variation in conjunction and preposition use. Right, so I approach this question by using a quantitative approach supplemented by qualitative methods. Specifically, I use a corpus-based and computational approach mixed with a little bit of ethnography. So the corpus is a social linguistic corpus I compiled for my dissertation called LANCORP or Lan the London Corpus. It contains roughly uh, almost like 400,000 words transcribed from roughly 32 hours of uh, recordings from fieldwork in Manila. And each transcribed utterance is linked to social, uh, social demographic data um, gathered from a survey. So if you look at the lower part of the screen, you can see a sample of the, of the corpus in CSV format. So the data preparation procedure can be summarized in five steps. So you have the pre-processing, the tagging, uh, tokenizing, coding, and final data creation. So I extracted Lana Wai utterances manually tagged a small a portion of the utterances for a part of speech and used machine learning to tag the rest automatically. Then I took all the conjunctions and prepositions, coded it further and created the final data set. So it, it looks something like this. So I have the raw text, then I tagged the text for a part of speech. So tokenized it and created a final data set with the social variables I'm interested in investigating. Using the data sets, I ran a series of linear mixed effects regressions with logistic link functions. I attempted to test for the potential effects of age, sex, proficiency, and attitudes on likelihood to adhere to the conventionalized pattern. I also fitted specific models on source language specific data, so not on all, the, you know, all of the data, but subsets of the data as well. Um, I tested for the effects of age, sex, and proficiency on the likelihood to use prepositions and conjunctions derived from Hokkien, Tagalog, or English. All right, so what did I find? Um, my first finding is that a significant part of the non-conforming or less popular conjunction tokens came from their speakers and speakers who viewed Lanongwe as baroque or broken. These speakers tended to um, derive conjunctions and prepositions that do not conform to the distributional patterns introduced earlier, supporting my hypothesis. Now, why are the younger speakers more likely to do this, right? So there are obviously a lot of reasons for this. Um, one likely explanation is because younger speakers are innovating. So in associated linguistic literature, younger speakers have been characterized as people with energy and enterprise and are thus likely to steer ahead um, language changes like this. So this idea isn't really far-fetched as I found this pattern in Lano and other linguistic domains and levels. So the, the, now the question is, if my findings are indicative of language change, is this change caused by drift or external factors? Will the Tagalog-derived word for because or uh, 
kasi in lana we change to the Hokkien derived word for because and we due to internal change, or will it be because of external factors? There seems to be more evidence for the latter account based on my ethnographic work. For one, I found that younger speakers in general have this renewed drive to preserve Hokkien. So one way of doing this is through the relaxification of lana we by adding more Hokkien derived words in lana we. So another explanation as to why younger speakers tend to vary is because they might have different group specific stylistic practices. So this is actually one of the, my, the findings I am really excited about. So for instance, one, for instance, one salient style is the Konya style. So there's no equivalent of this concept in English, but it roughly means privileged, fussy, effeminate, and redundant, and all others all rolled into one. So one feature of konya is is um, language mixing. And in younger speakers, in an attempt, perhaps in an attempt to not sound konyo and more proper, may have opted to frequently source conjunctions from a single language like Hokkien. Hmm. All right. <laughs> the existence of different styles in the younger group may account for the variation observed among its speakers. So older speakers consistently use the dog source kasi, but younger speakers can shift between proper and konyo ways of saying because. So, that, so in other words, style shifting could account for the lower conformance rate that we observe in my data. So how about speakers who viewed London West broken? So we're moving on to the second finding. So um, why do these speakers tend to derive conjunctions that do not conform or are less popular or do not conform to distributional patterns introduced earlier, right? So one explanation is that they were kind of like embodying their beliefs. So speakers who believe Lanangwe has systematic uh, conjunction patterns seem to be deliberately following the patterns, whereas those who believe that the patterns are non-existent tend not to. So they kind of like internalize their thoughts. Like, so if they think that it's random, then they're also going to be randomly mixing. So there is support for this account in my interviews and, and while I was observing the community. So just a quick recap, I found that a significant part of the non-conforming conjunction tokens came from younger speakers possibly because of innovation and or because they have a different stylistic repertoire compared to older speakers. Many of the tokens came from speakers who viewed Lana West broken potentially because these speakers were attempting to like embody their beliefs or internalize them. My second finding is that the sociolinguistic patterns of variation observed in conjunctions is not observed in prepositions. So all those findings earlier were just limited to conjunctions. I did not find the effect of any social factors, or rather, I didn't find any evidence of um, an effect on any social factors on preposition use. So why is this the case? So I argue that this is because of differences in awareness. So based on my ethnographic work, I found that speakers were highly aware of conjunctions as a linguistic resource. Throughout my interviews, speakers would um, give metalinguistic commentary about a derivation of conjunctions from certain languages, but this does not seem to be the case for prepositions where no one commented on the use of prepositions. So it, uh, it looks like speakers are aware about conjunctions, but not prepositions. And I think that it's this lack of awareness that could explain the absence of age effects in prepositions. So for example, one possible reason why we don't see an age effect is because speakers aren't even aware, or at least less aware, that mixing and preposition, prepositions can be used to express communeness or properness. And if this is the case, then it would explain the um, absence of social, social effects on the variation in prepositions. Okay, so the third and final major finding is that proficiency conditioned the variation in conjunction and preposition use. Speakers who reported high proficiency in Tagalog and English tend to use more pattern non-conforming or use the less popular variants than those who did not. And I propose two possible explanations for this. Um, one, it is possible that uh, knowledge of Hokkien and Tagalog vocabulary could influence Lanaway vocabulary. Um, speakers who are highly proficient in Tagalog and Hokkien might be more likely to draw on Hokkien and Tagalog derived resources made available by proficiency compared to those who are not. Hokkien and Tagalog derived resources might be more activated 
due to proficiency and increasing the likelihood of them being used in Lana way, regardless of whether they conform to the pattern. Another reason for the, for the um, proficiency effect most likely also has to do with um, express, expressing particular social meaning. In this case, good command of, of, of language. Speakers who said that they were proficient in Tagalog and Hokkien appear to have used more Tagalog and Hokkien derived vocabulary to indicate to others that they are good in, these, in those languages. And this account is also supported by my observations and field work where some speakers said that they used more Hokkien elements because they wanted to show, they literally, literally said this. So they wanted to show others how good they are in Hokkien. An expression of this particular social meaning could uh, explain the proficiency effect on variation because um, the proficiency variable is actually self-reported. So it actually makes sense, right? Um, in summary, Using corpus-based and computational methods, I found that in general, the variation that I observe in Lanaway distributional patterns involving conjunctions is conditioned by age, language proficiency in Tagalog and Hokkien, and language attitudes. I also found that variation in Lanaway prepositions is not conditioned by age, sex, proficiency, and attitudes, and that the effect of social factors of language could vary depending on the degree of awareness. So going back to my research questions, the answer to them is yes. Corrobor corroborating my other findings in other domains of Lanaue, of Lanaue, yeah. But while I answered my main questions, uh, so some questions remain unanswered, right? So for instance, why didn't English and Mandarin proficiency condition the variation? Is there something special about English and Mandarin in the community, for instance? Um, second, will proficiency in these languages Condition variation in other features of Lanaue. Finally, what other sociolinguistic variables can explain the variation, right? So, for example, if we directly model in style or characteristics associated with a particular style, will there be, will I observe the same patterns? So, currently, I'm not able to answer this as of now, and it's really meant to be more of like an exploratory approach. But I do hope so to do so in the future as part of my next steps. Um, and I feel like really there's a lot of room for exploration with respect to with respect to sociolinguistics in East Asia. So um, right, all right. So that's all I have for now. I'd like to give out uh, give a special shout out to my dissertation committee, especially especially my mentors Sally and Marlies for their detailed feedback. And um, thank you everyone for coming. All right, so uh, can one of the uh, co-hosts uh, turn my video on? <laughs> All right, can you hear me, Will? Okay, great. Yeah. All right, so um, let's see whether there are any questions. Will, I will let you look at the chat. So Danny is raising. All right, Danny has head. a head up. All right, Danny. Okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> All right. Thank you for this like awesome. I I don't know. I love to hear your work. And so it was cool to hear it more in detail from the defense. <laughs> so congrats. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I um I'm like obviously I'm curious about the 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 finding that like prepositions um don't seem to be conditioned at least by the social factors you looked at and I guess I was I mean towards the end you mentioned like style as like a potential thing you'd like to look at I was also wondering if like you just like based on your intuition or whatever you you have knowledge of so far like do you also think it might be conditioned by like linguistic factors more so like like the source languages of the surrounding words or something like that right so um for my for this uh for my particular study for this particular study i only focus on um just the word classes the preposition classes so i had like different subclasses of prepositions but i haven't really looked at um yeah the context word context and 
we know from the literature that linguistic factors can also uh, are also good predictors of like pre which preposition means, right? Especially with literature on code switching, for instance. Um, so yeah, I admit I haven't really looked at it yet, but um, but yeah, the mo the focus of my um, preface of my study right now is more on the social aspect of it. There's definitely room for it to explore, see whether other linguistic factors might actually contribute, like account for a lot of the variation that we see in um, not only conjunctions and prepositions. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Danny. The question. I, I have a question if I can. <laughs> hey. um, so I I was interested in um, I guess in in my own in my own work looking at uh, you know uh, communities like bilingual multilingual communities. One thing that I've noticed is that sometimes it's it's difficult to parse out whether um, you know basically it, it it's difficult to label one word as belonging to one language versus another um, because uh, there, you know, there might be elements where it be like morphological right. elements that come from other languages and then there might be like phonetic phonological elements that come from other languages. So I'm wondering at, when you were mm. kind of breaking down those like color coded categories of, you know, this comes from that language. Did you struggle at, at times to kind of separate those into categories? Right, so that's actually a really good question. Um, I expected there to be to be difficulty in like categorizing certain words, but I actually did not have that much difficulty. One of the reasons why I think this is the case is because Lano Aware is it does have like characteristics of mixed languages, and it's usually the I mean people have um, described it as being uh, as, as a language with a very clear split. Like let's say um, in Misha, is it you have like Cree and French together. And you can really see the, the, the split, right? Um, and in this case, I think in Lana way, you also see a very clear, a clear, a clear split, split between Hokkien derived words, like all derived words, English derived words, and even Mandarin um, elements. But uh, this is not to say that there are no innovations in the language. So there's, for instance, there you see certain morphemes where um, you can't really be traced any of the source languages. It just emerged, you know, because Lana way is independent. Um, also, so yeah, I yeah I didn't really have that much difficulty for conjunctions and prepositions, but I would expect there to be it to be a little bit harder in other um, categories, I guess, linguistic categories. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that question. Thank you, Sophie. Well, I have a, a question for you with uh, respect to uh, the two notions of uh, conyonness and uh, properness. I mean, this is, these are the words that you use. Could you please help us unpack those two notions? Because I mean, why is conio opposed you know, to proper and what is proper in the first place? Right, so I guess it is, uh, um... These two notions are really socially constructed. So I, I didn't really come up with the words conyo and proper. That it was really, so I'm looking at it from a bottom up approach. So students actually had this dichotomy of like what conyo and um, proper. So I, essentially it could be viewed as, the conyo could be viewed as something that is very, um, that, like, like I said, like uh, redundant. So you have like lots of like elements from, you have an element from Hokkien, but also the same element in English and Tagalog even if they have the same function. So people think it's redundant and some, somehow they associate that that feature is linked to this social no, notion of like someone being excessive, you know, uh, when uh, speak. Like they usually people who are tagged as Kanyo are people who over articulate stuff. Um, they act very elitist and uh, they don't, quote unquote, they do not use language properly. Well, I, I, I don't agree with that, but like that's how social, uh, the social categories came came about, and then you have, on the other hand, people who say that uh, the opposite of conio is proper. I, I think it's a very loose um, um, dichotomy. I'm pretty sure there's a better way of like expressing that, but 
that terminology actually came from uh, the community. So that's what I used. I like how you characterize them as social constructs, right? And um, can you tell us on which grounds you have decided, you know, that La Nangwe is actually, you know, a language, a language variety, as expressed by the title of your dissertation, you know, truly a language of our own. Is this a defense part two? <laughs> <laughs> we only well, have yeah. a very short one. Right. So um, I'm approaching this, uh, the criteria for like um, regarding La Nangwe as a language or highly language like I really drew on um, linguistic and social uh, definitions. So um, for instance, for the social aspect of it, like you do, you, I did notice observe people, like earlier I mentioned my talk that people, some people view it as broken. It's not a language, it's just ad hoc code switching and you can randomly mix and no one would care. And uh, on the other hand, you have people who actually say that it is a language. So that really came from them. It is a mixed language. It is a secret language and used to exclude people who do not <coughs> have one on heritage, for instance. So on that category, on that uh, criteria, you could say that there's some evidence for Lanawa being a language. And then you also, on the, uh, on the linguistic side of it, I did ob observe like patterns uh, that are um, consistently used uh, from speaker to speaker. There is variation and that's normal because language is basically the essence of language is variation. But yeah, um, but do you just, you do notice patterns like, uh, like for instance, um, certain variants and certain patterns of variation being consistent across speakers. And that's uh, what I found in my dissertation in the last three chapters. So yeah, um, there is evidence of stability and there's evidence of like conventionalization. And yeah, and the, so yeah, it's a mix of both linguistic and social criteria for me. Thank you. I see a hand raised uh, among the panelists. It was me. Thank you, Will, so much for this great talk. And I really like what you said about speakers themselves. You know, so some of them, at least, or many of them, see it as a language, and that you know, sort of deserves to be given its own right. um, status in that way. So that's really nice. Um, so I'm curious. You know, you talked about how. It seems like, hope, well, I'm curious about the different statuses of the different source languages, like, or how those um, source languages are felt or treated by um, speakers and what types of variation you see. So it seems like from what you said that Hokkien has like a special status maybe amongst younger people, um, sort of socially and not, right. not just that, but also like having more exposure to it. And then, yeah, and then it seems like, you know, maybe English and Mandarin weren't playing as much of a role, at least in this area. But anyways, I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about that, like how speakers are um, maybe differentially or similarly sort of giving status to the different source languages, however that's right. seen by them. I could talk all day about this, but <laughs> so yeah, it's really complex because like the status, um, like individual status, like how they perceive each of those source languages also kind of like vary from person to person. Although I do notice some like general tendencies. So for instance, um, for Hokkien, it is treated as an ancestral language. Like a lot of the Lanangs actually had ancestors from Southern China and the language they spoke was Hokkien. Um, so when they arrived at the Philippines, the language, um, you know, it, they used parts of Hokkien, parts of English and Tagalog and just combined it into Lanang way. But so ancestral, so it has this like status of being a very presti prestigious um, and authentic um, version of um, ancestral language. And then you have Tagalog or what people would call Filipino, um, which also has its status because it's, an, it's like, a, it's been promoted as the national language and a language of power. Like if you don't know Filipino, you can't really communicate with anyone in the Philippines or uh, you have to use English. And English is just basically um, dubbed by not just Filipinos, but also the Lanangs as the language of intel intellectualization. So if you don't know English, you really can't, you know, uh, make your findings known and stuff like that. So yeah, and another different, different sense, they're all treated with high prestige. Mandarin is also treated as high prestige. So it's treated like English in, a sense, in the Chinese speaking sphere. So if you know Mandarin, it'll connect you to the rest of the world. Um, so yeah. Um, 
Status-wise, I think all the language are have like pre prestige value, and they're all it's kind of like a diagnostic situation. So you use the Hokkien um, with in very cultural um, settings, like um, in association meetings where they where the tribe tribe meets or clan meets together and talk about certain stuff. And then you have English that's used in school, uh, in school, Tagalog or Filipino spoken um, with friends, with non Lanong friends, and then you have Lanong words spoken within the community, but not just limited to that, but in general, like they use it with the community as an intro, uh, community kind of language. So yeah, you have all these like factors, but yeah. Thank you, Savi. Uh, a great question. Thank you. So that brings us to uh, the end of the first um, uh, colloquium presentation. Uh, so right on time, Will. So thank you very much. And now we are going to pass on the baton to, um, sorry, I think we had maybe one question uh, by Bill. Sorry, Bill. <laughs> so a short question, sorry. Oh, it, it can be very short. I just wanted an example of, uh, of influence from Mandarin. I was. So a lot of the so this um, the, the influences from Mandarin I found in Lanao where I'm usually lexical, so this is very interesting because like um, you would expect Mandarin to have more influence because it's a language of it's a very prestigious language in the community, but uh, for some reason because speakers think that Mandarin is an outsider kind of language used by people from the mainland coming to the Philippines and there are like negative attitudes associated with that. A lot of the word it really hasn't seeped into the grammar of Lama way I'd say, and most of it are just lexical and really highly technical or specific uh, words. So that's why I wasn't really um, I didn't really present them because it's it's just very I would say superficial as of now based on my current investigation. Just can you give me an example of a of a noun or a verb or whatever? So like um, Xiao Kai. I think like the paper they would use for the calligraphy, for instance, oh, okay. or yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for your question. All right. You are going to pass on the baton to uh, uh, Savi and Felicia. All right. Thank you. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Felicia Bisnath today. Felicia earned her BA in Linguistics from the University of West Indies and her MA in Linguistics from the University of Amsterdam or UVA before we were lucky enough to have her join us at Michigan where she's a PhD candidate. Uh, Felicia tackles big questions in her work, asking how social context of language learning and use shapes language contact, particularly how, particularly how experience with spoken language might influence mouthing constructions in sign languages. And so this is a really ideologically charged space, particularly for a hearing researcher. And Felicia has worked and continues to work to make sure that her research pushes against deficit approaches and takes into account the whole of language users' repertoire. Uh, Felicia reads widely and across disciplines and theoretical approaches, which has led her to have a particularly rich perspective when it comes to tackling these complex questions. And so this includes her related line of work and how, um, how the ideologies of linguists themselves have influenced typological work. For example, the under description of mouthing constructions across languages. Um, she's also a highly sought after collaborator bringing her expertise in multimodal language contact, the study of linguistics and the study of the Creoles to several international collaborations, including a paper on sign language morphology within research group at the University of Birmingham and a workshop on equity, diversity, and inclusion in a language evolution. Felicia has presented widely at venues um, all over the place, internationally and here, and also right here. Um, so the research she's going to show you today is um, one piece of her QRP, which she's currently revising for resubmission, which is very exciting. Um, and I'll let her uh, take it from here. Let's please welcome Felicia. Okay, so everyone should be seeing my screen now, I hope. Um, 
So did someone raise a hand? Maybe that was a mistake. Um, all right. Okay. So uh, thank you, Savi, for that absolutely glowing introduction that may have dressed some parts of me up um, more than I think they should be, but thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so thank you for that. And also thank you to the colloquium committee for uh, having me here. Um, so uh, as Savi would have said, uh, this is my QRP work. And uh, so the title is Modeling Constructions in 37 Sign Languages, Typology, Ecology, and Ideology. And uh, before I start, I want to thank uh, Savi uh, a lot for like helping me. She was like extremely present during like this process. Uh, and Savi also, you know, really had the foresight to tell me that I probably needed to switch uh, my QRP projects like back in, you know, the summer of 2020 when we were doing beginning the pandemic. Uh, so thanks to Savi for that. And uh, also thank you to Marlies and Jeff for, they've been generally very supportive of me um, since I've gotten here and have also given me feedback uh, on this QRP in particular. Okay, so I will begin. All right, so uh, this is the way this will go. Uh, I'm gonna tell you about mouthing. Uh, then I'll tell you a little bit about sign language typology. Um, and that'll lead into my research questions and what I will actually present um, today. And then I'll give my method and my results. And the results are like the bulk of what I'll be presenting. So it's a, it'll be mainly descriptive stuff about the types of mouthing constructions, uh, their distribution and ideologies around them. And then I'll kind of go into some more, I don't know, big picture speculative type things uh, or like things that I've been thinking about. So uh, connecting social context to linguistic structure uh, and de facto prototypes. And then I will conclude. And uh, as I would have shown in the title, I'm promised uh, some typology, ecology and ideology. And this is kind of where I think they fit into this outline at least. Uh, okay. All right, so first um, uh, we'll, I'll define mouthing for us. So mouthing, uh, it's movements of the mouth in sign languages that correspond with those movements that are made when articulating specific synchronic spoken language words. So I think the best way to understand this very long definition is to uh, look at an example. So this example is coming from uh, New Zealand sign language and the ambient spoken language would be English. And as you can see, if you pay attention to his mouth, um, so this sign, this sign is uh, its cat. And as you can see, if you look at his mouth that his mouth actions are corresponding to what uh, we would produce when saying the English word cat. So that mouth action there, that is, that is a mouth thing. Okay, and I just wanted to show what mouthing could look like in like uh, a sentence or like uh, continuous signing. So this sentence, what is it saying? It's saying the cat caught a rat and brought it into my house. It was dead. Um, so as you can see, uh, mouthing is not on every single, uh, it's not associated with every single sign that's being signed, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit variable. Okay. All right, so uh, I just talked about mouthing and uh, what I actually looked at were mouthing constructions. And to me, the way I conceive of them is that they are uh, multimodal and multilingual uh, constructions. And I think of them as a pairing and the pairing part of this is, is what, I'm, what I, I think is really important. Uh, it's a pairing of a mouthing and a manual sign. So the, the way that I've been presenting it, as you can see in this figure, uh, I've been presenting it uh, using this kind of schematic uh, and I'll be using it uh, in this presentation. So we'll see that there's a, a mouth component and a manual component. Uh, the text above the mouth component will be like what the mouthing could be glossed as. Uh, the text above the manual component would be like a gloss for the manual component. And below all of that, so where we see A plus A in this particular example, uh, that would be what the combination of the mouthing and the manual sign uh, would mean. So in that uh, cat example that we just looked at, uh, this is kind of how I would uh, 
put it into this like schema thing. Okay, so uh, so I mentioned multimodality, and uh, in the case of mal things, uh, the multimodality I'm uh, thinking of it's not multimodal in the sense of like the way that speech and co-speech gesture like that's multimodal in that they are being produced in different modalities like the mouthing and manual signs they're being produced in the same modality um but there so it's more like multi-channel right it's like more like a multi-channel thing but no one actually uses that word so like multimodal is i think the best word to kind of flag this sort of like idea of information coming in from multiple channels and in terms of ideologies, um, I think this sort of multimodal perspective is relevant because mouthing can be thought of as flagging another modality. And that's relevant because there are negative ideologies to mouthing that are associated with like linguistic purism or can be associated with linguistic purism. Um, Right, so oh, I have this other figure in here, so I just I forgot to talk about this, but I said that I'm thinking about mouthings as being pairings of I'm thinking about mouthing constructions as being pairings of a mouthing and a manual sign, but I actually I will talk about uh, one construction that doesn't involve a manual sign at all. Okay, so now I'll talk about sign language typology. Uh, so there's two main like labels that are used uh, for different kinds of sign languages. Um, and I've just chosen two, there's deaf sign languages and rural sign languages. These aren't the only labels associated with this division, but this is just what I've decided to go with. Uh, and I'll describe the different uh, ecological contexts associated with them. So in a deaf sign language, there are deaf people born into hearing non-signing families. Um, there's congregation of deaf people in urban centers at deaf schools and clubs. And there's like a, a larger non-signing hearing population. So an example of a language like that could be Nicaraguan sign language. And then in the rural sign language context, it's associated with a high incidence of congenital deafness, isolated areas, and maybe developing countries as well. Uh, and, and with hearing people uh, being able to sign or at least being, you know, used to communicating with deaf people. And an example of that would be Katakolot, which is uh, rural sign language in Bali. So uh, one thing I wanted to point out here, and because as Savi said that I, I, I do have interest in Creoles, is that I think these two groupings they, they're like Creoles in that they aren't identifying a structural type, but they're picking out uh, different kinds of linguistic ecologies. And uh, so I'm presenting these two labels to you, but I really want to say and like stress that they should be used with caution because uh, like one sign language can have properties of both of these different contexts that I just mentioned. And the individual uh, groupings, they, uh, conf they can conflate different ecological contexts as well. So they, they're very broad generalizations and more nuances needed. Um, and so the reason that I bring them up is when I was thinking and like working on my QRP, I use them in sampling these two labels, but also I'm interested in identifying causal relationships between social properties and mouthings. And so what I'm going to present here today is like sort of the cross linguistic kind of background for like for pursuing such a such a, an idea. Okay, so just going into my research questions and the research questions are like directly connected to what I'm going to show. So the question was how are mouthing constructions manifested across sign languages and what is their distribution across sign languages. And for my method, uh, so the data generally came from online sources because of COVID stuff. Um, and what I did is I searched for words like mouth, mouthing, and lip uh, to find potentially relevant sources. And if the descriptions of what was going on with those mouth actions ma uh, matched my definition of mouthing, then I you know, decided to use that source. And so there's definitely like a bias towards positive mention of mouthing in my sample. And like, 
this is not representative of all sign language descriptions at all. It's very much a convenient sample, but it also makes sense that it's a convenient sample because like there's not a lot of sign language documentation and there's even less documentation of mouthings. So I don't really have like, we don't really have like or pick, right? We just kind of have to take what we get. Okay. So this is what the sample looks like. So there's 37 sign languages, 26 deaf ones, which are represented in blue, and 11 that are in orange. And uh, the proportions of these, the deaf and rural sign languages, they match the proportions in glottolog, because um, you can see there's a clear imbalance, right? OK. All right, so when I looked at the literature, I basically identified if mouthing was used or not, and then I coded for that. And uh, then I also identified what constructions mouthing appeared in. And I found about 20 different constructions, but I only selected four of them. And I chose those four because they are reported enough to make potential cross-linguistic patterns visible. So the other ones that I found, they were sort of like, a lot of them were like one-off uh, kind of thing, kinds of constructions that I probably wouldn't find anywhere else. Okay. So uh, into the results, uh, in terms of presence of mouthing, um, I found uh, that the th 35 out of the 37 sign languages that I looked at, they did say that mouthings were present, or there was some indication that uh, mouthing existed. And uh, so that means that there were two, two languages where it was said that mouthing was absent. One of them was deaf, which was Nicaraguan sign language. And uh, the second one was Catacoloc, which is a rural sign language. So the rest of the discussion that I will have where I talk about the mouthing constructions is of course only, it's based on the 35 languages that report to them. Okay, so these are the four constructions that I will talk about. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is I will describe them and give some examples. And I'll have like other stuff on these slides that I won't talk about, just sort of like in the interest of time. Um, but we can go back to them if we want to. And at the end of that, I will kind of look at the, we'll look at like at some bar graphs, right? <laughs> and try to look at some patterns kind of. Okay, so the first one and the, in the previous examples that I've shown, uh, the first, so the, that first one is congruent mouthing. And um, the other names that I found for this is standard mouthing. And the, this kind of mouthing construction uh, in this kind of mouthing construction, the manual sign and the mouthing can be glossed with the same word. Uh, so this is an example from Swedish Sign Language, and uh, it's a sign for cat. And basically on the mouth, you get like mouthing that could be glossed as the Swedish word for cat. And on the hands, you get a sign that could be glossed as cat. And altogether, you get cat. That's the overall meaning. And I found this in 43% of the sample. And it's usually, well, in sign languages that, re that say something about this, uh, they say that it's usually the most common kind of mouthing. Uh, so this was mentioned for British Sign Language, Irish Sign Language, and Italian Sign Language. Then the second kind of construction that I looked at were the free mouthings. So other names that I've seen for this is solo, added, or independent. And in this kind of construction, the mouthing, there's just a mouthing, there isn't any manual sign. So this is an example here uh, from Chinese sign language where uh, the signer is just mouthing, uh, like the mouth formations correspond to the mouth formations for the Chinese word for why. And this, sign this kind of construction is reported the least only in like 19% of the languages. And the, so these are the examples that I actually found of free mouthing. And there aren't like clear patterns to me in like what kinds of words get to be free mouthings. Uh, but you can see, so you can see there's like functional words, um, there's like lexical words, and there's also these like chunks, kind of like frequent, I wanna say frequent chunks, like I don't know, or uh, let's go. Okay, and the third construction type that I'll talk about is the morphosyntactic type. 
And the other names that I found for this is uh, complementation, simultaneous compounds, and like specifying mouthing. And in this kind of uh, construction, the manual sign and the mouthing have independent specific meanings that combine to form a complex morphosyntactic construction with a compositional meaning. So the example that I have here is from Jakarta Sign Language. And uh, so on the hands you're seeing, well, on the hands is the sign for, that could be glossed as children. And on the mouth is, um, it could be glossed as together. And the actual mouthing would look something like sama sama. And that combination together means together with the children. Uh, so this kind of construction, it was reported in like 27% of the sample, so not a lot. Um, and I found 13 concrete examples of it. It's like pretty rare, I would say. And uh, so there's six types that I found. Uh, I'll just mention two of them. So in the first kind, um, uh, yeah, well, maybe, yeah, I agree with you, Kelly. Yeah, maybe, maybe you're right, yeah. <laughs> uh, so in the first kind that I'll mention, the mouthing is acting like uh, a nominal modifier. So in uh, this example is from Norwegian Sign Language. And on the hands, you get a sign that can be glossed as pullover. And on the mouth, you get the mouthing that can be glossed as red. And together, you get red pullover. And then the, in the other example, the mouthing is an object complement. So this is from Sign Language of the Netherlands. And on the hands, you're getting, um, you're getting the verb. And that can be glossed as to eat. And on the mouth, you're getting the Dutch word corresponding to bread, or that could be glossed as bread, so you're getting broad. And uh, together, that means eat bread. Okay, so that's three of them. And now uh, this is the final kind. Uh, so this is the morphophonological kind. And the other term, well, the other names that I've seen for this is like this ambiguating. And uh, so in this type, the manual sign is the same across the group with mouthings related in some predictable way to the manual sign. So with the other three constructions that I talked about, they were really like talking about individual signs, right? Whereas in this case, it's really the, I think the core defining feature of this is the, the group membership part of it. Um, so we have three kinds or three that I identified. I'll just talk about two of them. So first we have the polysemous kind, or that's what I've been calling it. And in this kind, mouthings are semantically related to each other and to the manual sign. So the example that I have here is from Adama Robe Sign Language, which is a rural sign language uh, from Ghana. And what we're looking at here is a set of color terms. So on the hands, so across the group, uh, we have the same manual form. So it looks something like this, and it can be glossed as a sense. And then we have different mouthings. And these different mouthings are used to disambiguate uh, or to like pick out specific color terms. So for example, the sign for white is the sen sign plus the akan, uh, well, a, a mouthing corresponding to the Akan word for white, which is pita. Um, and then the sign for black is basically is the same thing, except the mouthing is different. It corresponds to the Akan word for black. So there's that. And the second kind I'll talk about is the uh, initialized kind. And in this type, the initial letter or sound of the spoken language word corresponding to the mouthing is represented on the hands with the corresponding manual alphabet hand shape. Um, and the constructions, they are related to each other in that they begin with the same sound or letter. So they're not necessarily semantically related. There's nothing preventing them from being semantically related, but they're not necessarily so in the way that I think the polysemous ones are. So, that was like a mouthful. And now I will give an example that will probably help explain better. So this comes from Auslan, which is uh, it's Australian Sign Language. And uh, on the hands, we're seeing the sign for the manual alphabet hand, uh, the manual alphabet, alphabet hand shape for G, which is like this. So that's the same across the group. 
And on the mouth, we're seeing different mouthings. Uh, so the sign for geography is like the G hand shape and the mouthing are, that could be glossed as geography. Uh, and for a garage, that sign G hand shape and the uh, mouthing can be glossed as garage, etc. So as you can see, like geography, garage and Gosford, like they, there's no semantic relationship that I can see between them uh, in, the, in the way that there seems to be like a semantic similarity with the color terms, for example. Okay, so this was reported a bunch in 68% of the sample. And I mean, this is probably partially because there's like different types like within uh, the morphophonological type, right? Um, but yeah, so the polysemous type, they were reported like way more than any other type. And the most commonly reported lexical sets were WH words, kinship terms, and color terms. And so that's it for like the individual descriptions of the mouthing constructions. And this is what the kind of patterns like looked like. So on the, in the, uh, in the first panel, we're seeing the data for deaf sign languages. And the second one, it's for rural sign languages. On the X axis, we have the different constructions and on the Y we have um, number. And so gray, I'll just pull out the gray. Uh, the gray parts of this shows what was unreported, right? So the stuff that I don't have data points for. Uh, the blue represents when uh, like a sign language said that the construction was present. And the orange says that, uh, well, represents when it was said that the construction is absent. So as you can see, there's more unreported data than reported. There's more reporting for deaf compared to rural sign languages. There's the most reporting for morphophonological constructions. And the only construction type that's reported, that, that is reported as absent is the free, the free construction. Okay, so that's it for the mouthing constructions. And then I wanted to go into ideologies about mouthing. So people think about mouthings as being linguistic. So, um, and linguistic in the sense of like being uh, like language contact phenomena. So like, you know, taking part in like code switching or code blending. Um, but then like, sometimes this is used to say that, oh, well, mouthing is linguistic, but it's not a part of sign language grammars, right? So there's a difference in opinion on if mouthings are actually part of sign language grammars. And then there's also been arguments have also been made uh, that mouthings are non-linguistic. And sometimes the way that this is made is by saying that by comparing them to gesture. So the reason that I mentioned this is this really affects like what is documented, right? So if you don't think a thing is linguistic or part of a sign language grammar, then you're probably not gonna write it down in, in your descriptions, right? And so, we, so then we, we, miss, we miss some things uh, in descriptions. And then outside of that, there are potential regional differences. So like in linguistic traditions, I guess. So supposedly there's a more positive attitude towards discussion of mouthings in sign languages in European sign languages compared to the US. And then of course, uh, we have ideologies about mouthing from signers. So regarding mouthings, um, there, it has been reported that mouthings aren't considered to be part of real ASL, where real ASL refers to the ASL that occurs between deaf people, so no hearing people present. And uh, in Kyle Gay sign language, which is a rural sign language used in Papua New Guinea, mouthing is said to be a marker of disfluency. In Norwegian sign language, free mouthing is said to not be acceptable. And then, uh, so this, this is about signing without mouthing. So this is, this is basically like positive attitudes towards mouthing. So all of this comes from Italian sign language. And this was from a study on metalinguistic awareness where they were asked to like comment on a video of someone signing Italian sign language without any mouthing. And so I'll just share some quotes of what people said. So someone said that it's not natural. So not using mouthing is not natural. It's like they're making an effort. And someone else said that they don't feel comfortable when people don't use mouthings. They look cold. 
uh, without facial expression and unpleasant. And then someone else says that the signing is not fluent without mouthing. And then a final person says, I do not want to be speechless. So you can really see that like, I mean, this seems to me like good evidence that mouthing is like indexing, like spoken uh, identity kind of. And that I guess like this person, this deaf person uh, is using mouthing to, you know, uh, to like associate themselves with a uh, spoken language in some way. Um, okay. All right. So that's the like bulk of the sort of like descriptive stuff that I found. And now we will go on to things that I think about or have thought about. Um, so the, uh, I remember like I said that uh, I'm interested in like these kinds of causal relationships. Um, but of course, like I looked at like some of Sally's work on like deliberate language change, and uh, she's a bit pessimistic about the predictive power of causal chains. And I mean, rightfully so, right? Because the same social facts can lead to different outcomes and like different social facts can also lead to the same outcomes. And also like users can change any feature of their language through linguistic hygiene practices. Um, and mouthing, I would think is definitely a target for linguistic hygiene. Uh, but so regardless of that, I still have some thoughts about some potential links um, and specifically thinking about ideology in terms of like pedagogy or as like represented uh, in pedagogy kind of. Um, so first, I think morphophonological constructions, they can be linked to education. So the polysemous constructions, so these are the, the ones that I talked about the, with the color terms. Um, they, I think those high frequency lexical sets are likely to be taught in groups. And so like in Norwegian, uh, not, uh, sorry, in New Zealand sign language, uh, it's said that numerals may be more rapidly affected by school usage uh, than the overall lexicon because numbers are explicitly and extensively rehearsed as a conventional set of high frequency vocabulary in the classroom. So like this rehearsal and this sort of like group presentation I think that could lead to a situation where um, mouthing could be used to, as a disambiguating uh, factor. Um, and then for the initialized constructions, I think they could be linked to teaching phonemes uh, in written language. So what I'm showing here, this is, uh, this is uh, from the teaching of Brazilian sign language. And the goal here was to teach the phoneme uh, p, uh, so what, what is done is like they present, like the teachers present like a bunch of different words that start with uh, P, right? Uh, so we get like the word for shovel, foot, dust, stick, sink, brace, bread, spinning top. And all of these words, the similarity that they have is that they begin with the same sound or letter. Um, there is isn't like semantic similarity uh, among them. So I think that like maybe that could like, again, that kind of group presentation that's like really focusing on the initial letter that could be um that could be encouraging the use of like mouthing to disambiguate okay and then finally i had some thoughts about prototypes so there is a documentation inequality between deaf and rural sign languages and i think that if you know these typologists who are interested in like identifying sign language types, they need to be careful in how they treat rural sign languages. And this goes back to like, you know, the different, like how Creoles have been treated. So I think that rural sign languages, they could end up being treated like a kind of homogenous social and structural type in the way that Creoles have been because of these differences in documentation between deaf and rural sign languages. So I think we need to be like really careful about that to kind of you know, not replicate like those mistakes that have been made uh, in Creole linguistics. And uh, final sort of thing is I've been thinking about this thing that I'm calling de facto prototypes. And I think the way I think of them is that they're like languages or groups that are commonly cited uh, and or used to exemplify certain properties. And I think like those kinds of like common pairings could pigeonhole these languages in linguistics in a way. So like some examples would be like, you know, when you think of all harmony, you probably think might think of Turkish. And there's this idea of Creoles being used to like illustrate simplicity. 
And then Nicaraguan Sign Language is used a lot to talk about language emergence. And then Catacoloc, uh, as we saw, it doesn't report mouthing. Um, and Catacoloc is relatively well studied compared to other rural sign languages. So it's possible that uh, people could extrapolate ideas about Catacoloc to other rural sign languages in a way that's kind of unwarranted. Uh, and so perhaps they could think people might, it might lead to like ideas about rural sign languages not having mouthings, whereas like in my research, what I just showed, we see that they do have more things. Um, so I think that doing this kind of like targeted cross-linguistic comparison can actively work against like these sorts of ideas. Um, and the, the thing I really want to stress is like the, the targeted part of it. Because I think like, I mean, we all um, do some kind of, we all look at the literature, right? Um, but if we aren't doing typology, if if looking at structural diversity is not the point of our research, then we can we can sort of focus on uh, more popular or like well studied languages uh, to base our research on, uh, and um, that can just like compound their influence in the literature. So I think like actually making diversity like the target of research can really push back against that. Okay. Um, so I just said a bunch of stuff and now I'm just gonna try to sum it up. So uh, mouthing is a language contact phenomenon that's found in a bunch of different forms in sign languages. Uh, it's reported in 35 out of the 37 sign languages that I looked at. Um, negative ideologies about mouthing can lead to them not being documented and then that affects like typology. Um, and ideologies about, about mouthing differ in different sign languages. And going to morphophonological constructions, I think they could be connected to specific pedagogical practices. And finally, uh, targeted comparison could move against the influence of uh, de facto prototypes. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Sorry, thank you so much, Felicia. I have a little, um, a little additional person here now, so I'm a little bit uh, out of it. Um, but let's thank our speakers. <laughs> and um, now uh, let's see if uh, folks have uh, questions. Raise your hand or throw it in the chat. I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Marlise. All right. Well, Felicia, I really love, you know, this project of yours. And uh, I really like how you pair the typology, you know, with the, the ideologies. And um, I was just wondering about something that you said, and I'm not sure whether I, I got that right. When you were talking about uh, the research in uh, Europe, showing that there may be some more positive attitudes towards mouthing than in the US. Did I get that right? Um, so I, what I was trying to say is that like linguists, like linguists working on European sign languages have been said to be more positive about talking about mouthing as part of those sign languages compared to uh, in the US. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you know what uh, are the underlying factors to those more positive uh, observations there compared uh, to here? Well, so I think like, so yeah, so one thing definitely is that like, so this was like a long time ago. Well, I mean, maybe it's not that long, like in the 90s. I don't know if that's like a long time ago. Um, like, so like in the 90s, like people were really trying to like, you know, separate like sign languages, like, you know, uh, kind of uh, present sign languages as being independent and like their own thing. Like they're not like a manually coded like spoken language, right? So like trying to like separate sign languages from spoken language and then that would kind of lead to like, okay, let's not talk about mouthing or let's not highlight mouthing, right? Um, and I think, well, I mean, this is also just broad speculation here, but maybe 
I don't know, maybe because there's probably more like languages in play, like there's more uh, multilingualism in Europe. I don't know, maybe that might be relevant. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it was really trying to, in, with this goal of trying to uh, present sign languages as being legitimate and independent of spoken languages. Thank you. Other questions? Well, as I have many, but I don't want to just publicly dialogue with you. <laughs> oh, we have a, a question from Akrizi. Go ahead, Akrizi. Or oh, maybe, did you put your hand one, down, Akrizi? There is one from- Oh, there he is, okay. From Deal as well, okay. I think you're muted, maybe. Sorry, that as well. <laughs> All right, I'm on the cell phone. It's sort of like just switching things here. Uh, it's a little bit hard. Hi, Felicia, very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, very, very uh, informative. Um, sorry, I may have missed something about the, when you were talking about the attitudes about, uh, about Maldi, right? And you say that people might not report in the literature, so they might not describe Maldi when they have those attitudes. Um, I, you may have mentioned this. Um, did you find uh, two different studies, two different descriptive studies on the same sign language that would have shown that difference in ideology and some reflection on how mouthing was described? I mean, the yeah. actual facts that they reported about the mouthing. Yeah, um, so, well, okay. So one thing about like the, descriptions is like when they do sometimes like when mouthing is mentioned they're just kind of like mouthings exist and like don't actually show any data right um but i believe this was with adam is not is it adam or maybe it's al Said veteran sign language which is a rural sign language in um in israel um there were like there was like one researcher like explicitly saying that that like people don't record these things and then I found like from different people who had worked on those sign languages, sometimes people say like, oh, all mouth things don't exist or like, uh, and then someone else would be like, yeah, they do exist, but they're very rare and that kind of, that kind of thing. So yeah, I mean, I get your point to that. Like some of what I'm saying is a little bit like speculative, but like, I think the al Said veteran sign language stuff probably is like good evidence that there is disagreement about the status of mouth things that is linked to like, what is recorded? No, I don't think it's, uh, what you're saying is actually sort of very interesting in that it actually might uh, be reflected there in terms of what people would have described uh, in, in their data, right? It's just that it would be just add a, a, an additional layer of evidence to what you said. Yeah, so one thing that I forgot to mention or that I should say now is that, so we found that the morphophonological constructions were reported more and it might be because I like conflate, well, I like had multiple groups in that single group. But uh, so in that kind of construction, like the mouthing is used to disambiguate. And my idea about this is that like linguists would mention this kind of construction a lot because the mouthing is like performing like a contrastive, like phonemic, like that word has been used, uh, a phonemic kind of role. So like there you can see that like the kind of construction, like the role of the mouthing could potentially be influencing if it's mentioned or not. I don't know if that like, that's kind of, that, that, that is like relevant as well, <laughs> yeah. Cool, thank you. And uh, since, I, since I'm on, on video here, I just wanna um, yeah, thank the, the colloquium committee uh, for the great job um, managing the colloquium this year and handling all of it, it it's been great. And uh, thank you and Will uh, for the great talks. Um, and then wish everyone um, a great summer as we are getting into that and uh, we won't have an opportunity for this again. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Bill.
Um, hi. So I was thinking about the fact that Nicaraguan sign language is thought of as an example of language emergence, but um, is there anything wrong with saying that a, a rural sign language is also an example of language emergence? Is there some difference between that other than scale? Um, so no, I, I wouldn't think it's, oh, wait, can you, can you say that again? Yeah, so um, Nicaraguan sign language is regarded as a case where a language has emerged and I guess is thought of as, is contrasted with rural sign languages, uh, seeming to imply that they are not also languages that have emerged. And I just wondered if there was any reason for that or if uh, uh, we, people just happen to notice that this Nicaraguan, I mean, of course, this we understand the circumstances were different in Nicaragua because it did probably result from consolidating deaf institutions and so forth, but isn't a local sign language also an, a, a, a language that has emerged? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think so, like Nicaraguan. So like I, yeah, so like Nicaraguan sign language is thought about this language that emerged and a lot of it is because there's a lot of documentation of that. Uh, and like definitely people do talk about like these, some of some rural sign languages as being emerging sign languages. And uh, part of, part of that, like, you know, vocabulary is this sort of, so like, as I said, these rural sign languages are usually found in kind of, I don't know if usually found is the correct word, but they're like, in isolated kinds of areas. So you get like some linguist from like uh, the global north, uh, you know, like sort of like discovering this language, kind of like going in and discovering. And then they will kind of talk about emergence or like a language being like young or, or like that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think like uh, all of those languages could be thought of as like, I mean, depending on like when in their process they start being researched, that would determine if they were being thought of as like emerging or not. I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but I think I agree with you. Well, yeah. I, 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 is there some sense in which uh, rural sign languages at least sometimes are not as fully developed as uh, something like Nicaraguan sign language or ASL or uh, so that so, they create difficulties for the for the people who use them. Um, so I definitely I don't think they create difficulties at all. Um, like they yeah they don't create difficulties at all. And like so one thing like so you know we have these different groups and one real problem that we've had in sign language linguistics uh, is like trying to like think about those groups as being developmental. So that like a, a, a rural sign language will eventually develop into like a, a deaf sign language. So like Nicaraguan sign language will eventually, no, that like catacolloc will eventually look like ASL. So like definitely we have like uh, ideas about that sort of floating around, but it's not like, it's not true. Like it doesn't like make sense. Like there's no, there isn't a developmental cline between like deaf and like rural sign languages. They're like their own thing. Um, so yeah, yeah. Thank you. I think, uh, do we go till 5.30? Yes, yeah, that's, okay. um, yeah. We have okay. about four more minutes if there are more questions. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, Jeff's hand has disappeared. 
I think he's coming. Okay. Or I see. Yeah, can can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, it showed all sorts of things I had to click here. Um, <laughs> my question is, um, are there any cases where the uh, the correspondence between the the mouthing and the and the sign goes beyond individual uh, words and becomes phrasal? And are there cases where there's uh, perhaps cor uh, in 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 places where the the sign language has a lot of similarities in, in sign order to the spoken language where that you get a, a kind of a choreography between the uh, the mouthing and, and the signs? Ah, okay, so I didn't really find examples of like phrasal uh, mouthing like so so we definitely found like you know phrases being mouthed, but I found that with like the the in the cases where there wasn't a manual sign, um, I didn't find like examples of like a single manual sign and then like a phrasal mouthing. I didn't see that. Um, I think like in like running like signing, you could potentially get you definitely will get overlap uh, in like mouthings and signs, but I don't know like if it's like how big that overlap is and if that it would if it would be like phrasal so there's that and your second question was if um the the way i interpret it is like if you would do like a mouthing and then a sign and then like a mouthing so it would be like a sort of sequential sequential structure but like in different modalities and i haven't seen that at all and i think it probably doesn't exist um but yeah i was actually thinking more of 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 phrase at both levels and kind of synchronously and, and organized in some way that went beyond word to uh, word to mm -hmm. individual sign connections yeah i so actually i mean i haven't really seen that being reported and i think so there's differences in uh what kinds of words get mouthed so like verbs, for example, like it's said that like verbs aren't typically associated with mouthing. Uh, so it's mostly nouns. So in that case, I would say like based on that, I would probably say no, but I, I, I haven't seen it. Um, okay, thank you very much. I enjoyed the talk. Thank, thank you. you. All right, it's 5.30, so let's thank uh, both of our speakers and um, thank the colloquium committee for putting this together. Um, and uh, thank everybody <laughs> uh, for being here. Thank you, everyone. And then remember, we have a gathering uh, on, on Monday from 11.30 to 1.30, so that we can uh, celebrate, among many other things, our two uh, colloquium presenters today.